Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. My wife received a text message inviting her to a party with the exchange of. Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy! I was just at our mailbox at the end of the driveway checking the mail when a red BMW drove by and turned into the neighbor's house. As the car pulled up to the garage, the door opened to let the car in and then closed again. This seemed strange to me. I knew Kyle Good was away, so why was someone else entering their garage? I considered there might be many innocent explanations, like it being Doris's cousin or brother. Regardless, it was none of my business, and I quickly forgot about it when I noticed a letter from my sister Gina in Florida. Gina always writes great letters full of family news and lots of clippings from the publications she subscribes to. The next morning, as I was leaving for work, the BMW sped past me so quickly that I had to slam on the brakes to avoid a collision. I might have dismissed the incident if Jenny and I hadn't stopped by the Goods house on Friday night while walking the dog. The red BMW was parked on the street, and Kyle was standing on his porch talking to the man I had seen driving the car earlier in the week. Kyle and the man approached us as we walked along the sidewalk. George, Jenny, hello, Kyle greeted us. Jenny and I paused until the two men reached us. George, I'd like you to meet my best friend, Harry Thompson. Harry, this is our neighbor George. I shook Harry's hand and turned to introduce Jenny. This is my wife, Jenny. It didn't surprise me that Harry, after letting go of my hand, took Jenny's hand and held it a bit too long. When you're married to someone as beautiful as Jenny, you get used to men showing extra interest, but there was something about Harry's expression, a sort of smirk, as if he knew something I didn't. Now that I knew Harry was Kyle's best friend and not a relative, I couldn't help but wonder why he was spending the night at Kyle's place while Kyle was away. Could there be something between Harry and Kyle's wife, Doris? I couldn't imagine a worse scenario than a best friend being involved with his friend's spouse, but I tried to consider other possibilities. Maybe Harry was just staying for business reasons. I asked Harry where he lived, and he replied, across the river in St. Paul. That seemed unlikely, he wasn't related and didn't live far enough away to need a place for the night. Harry still seemed overly interested in Jenny, so I suggested we continue our walk and said goodbye to Kyle and Harry. This left me with a dilemma, should I mention anything to Kyle? Part of me wanted to stay out of it, but part of me thought Kyle deserved to know if his wife was being unfaithful. By Sunday, my decision was made. While Kyle was mowing the lawn, I walked over to talk. After exchanging pleasantries, I got straight to the point. Kyle, on Monday evening while you were away, your best friend Harry spent the night at your house. I was taken aback by Kyle's reaction, he even started laughing. Of course he did, Kyle said with a chuckle. I'm sure he gave Doris a lot of pleasure. I was speechless. Kyle continued laughing as he explained, George, I thought you knew Doris and I have an open relationship. We often swap partners with others. It took me a moment to process this. Are you saying that you both sleep with other people? You even swap partners? Kyle seemed to enjoy my confusion. Yes, George. We arrange gatherings with several couples and sometimes singles like Harry. We all switch partners. I was still trying to grasp this when Kyle asked, Would you and Jenny be interested in joining us? We're always looking for new members. This brought me back to reality. No, Kyle, there's no way we'd participate in something like that. As I turned to leave, Kyle called after me, It's a pity. Interestingly, this wasn't the first time the subject of partner swapping had come up. A few months ago, Jenny and I were relaxing after an intimate moment when she asked me about my fantasies. I pondered the question as my heart rate and breathing slowly returned to normal. I'd like to spend some time together on the beach, I suggested. Apparently, I didn't give Jenny the answer she was hoping for, so she asked again what else I was thinking. I was almost afraid to mention it but decided to give it a chance. Promise me you won't think I'm being odd if I tell you. Jenny propped herself up on her elbow and turned to face me. I promise, George. What is it? Remember, you promised. I want you to dress up in something that makes you look approachable, like a stylish dress with high heels. Then go to the hotel bar by yourself, sit on a high stool, and just enjoy yourself. I'll come in later, pretend I don't know you, and buy you a drink. We'll talk for a while, and then I'll take you back to our room. 
What if someone else tries to approach me? Jenny asked. You'll just ignore them, I replied. Jenny seemed intrigued. Wouldn't it be exciting for you to see me interact with someone else before you pick me up? Not really. My fantasy involves you dressing up in public, but not something like that. What about swapping partners? Have you ever thought about being with another couple or multiple couples? I asked. Jenny looked thoughtful. I don't have any desire for that, and I certainly don't want to watch someone else with you. Have you ever considered it? Jenny was perceptive enough to give me the right answer, realizing my fading interest. No, George. I was just asking because many couples have that fantasy. I wanted to know if it was something you were interested in. Jenny ended the call, and I fell asleep almost immediately, forgetting the conversation. It wasn't until months later, when I was telling Jenny about some social events, that I recalled her question about partner swapping. After leaving Kyle that afternoon, I walked back to our house. Jenny was sunbathing in a bikini. I grabbed a beer from the fridge and sat next to her on the terrace. Did you know that the goods are involved in unusual social activities? I asked. Jenny's response was telling. Whenever she talks to someone, she lifts her sunglasses so they can see her eyes. Her father had once told me to remove my glasses when talking to someone, saying it made him distrustful when my eyes were hidden. So when Jenny turned to me still wearing her sunglasses, I sensed something was off. No, George, why do you think that? Kyle mentioned that Harry spent the night at their house, and Kyle said they have an open relationship with parties and partner swapping. I can't believe you talked about Doris like that. Why did you tell Kyle? Jenny asked. If you were cheating on me, I'd want a real friend to let me know. It's still a betrayal. Jenny then said, it depends on the seriousness of the offense. Small things aren't worth mentioning, but important matters are. But what's the harm if Doris is unfaithful? Jenny asked. It's just a night. I was stunned and silent when Jenny added, whatever the goods do is their business. As long as we love and trust each other and stay true to our vows, we shouldn't quarrel. Come here and kiss me, you haven't kissed me in hours. I kissed Jenny, but the conversation lingered in my mind. Over the next few weeks, I started observing Jenny more closely. Our daily life seemed normal, and our intimate moments were as frequent and fulfilling as ever. There were no external signs of trouble except for two things. First, one day I noticed Jenny's phone was locked, a new habit, as she had never locked it before. Secondly, she was clearing the history on her computer, which was unusual for her. Although these points were minor, I felt uneasy and decided to take action. I installed a program on our computer that recorded activity in the background. Although Jenny could clear the browsing history, the program saved it in a file that I could review. It wasn't difficult to unlock her phone. I casually asked Jenny for her brother's phone number, and as she unlocked her phone, I discreetly recorded the image in the mirror with my phone. Over the following weeks, I noticed that Jenny frequently visited websites with content centered on multiple partners. I monitored her phone and saw nothing out of the ordinary until I told her that I had to go on a business trip for a week and a half. My job as a translator required regular travel, and employees took turns to avoid overloading any one person. Two days after I mentioned the trip, during which Jenny appeared very upset, I discovered a message from Doris on Jenny's phone. The message read, We agreed on Saturday. Despite the short notice, five couples have confirmed their participation. We're excited to have you with us again. See you then. I was enraged. My wife was pretending to miss me while planning to attend a social event that I found deeply troubling. The word again in the message was particularly infuriating. I knew it was time to take action. The next morning, I made an appointment with a divorce lawyer and asked my boss if I could cancel the business trip. After some reluctance, he agreed to let me take 10 days off, though he grumbled about the inconvenience. Instead of heading to the airport, I checked into the residence inn, rented a car with my company credit card, a clear policy violation I no longer cared about, and bought what I needed. I met with the divorce attorney on Friday to explore my options. The outlook was grim. We would divide our assets, and I would likely have to pay child support for up to five years. Jenny worked part-time and earned little, which meant I'd need to support her financially until she found a new profession. The lawyer's response was disheartening, yes, 
Under current laws, you would still be responsible for supporting her despite the circumstances. I felt naive for both my trust in Jenny and my understanding of the legal system. I asked the lawyer if there were any alternatives to avoid being financially exploited. He advised, before we proceed, write me a check for $500. This conversation is confidential, and this will be our final interaction. I wrote out the check and gave it to him. Let me ask you two questions. Do you like your job, and do you have family nearby that you would miss? He asked. I answered that I disliked my job and my family had moved to Florida. The lawyer leaned back and said, I'm not offering legal advice, but if I were in your position, I would disappear. Take everything you can from your accounts and move away. It's different if you have children, but in your case, the world is wide, and it's time to explore it. This was the last thing I expected to hear. I should have asked why such a radical approach was recommended. The lawyer explained, for years ago, I had a similar situation. I caught my wife with her trainer. Despite hiring one of the best divorce lawyers, I still pay alimony monthly and will continue to do so. The system is stacked against people like us. I left the lawyer's office shaking my head, starting to formulate my plans. But first, I needed to know exactly what Jenny and her neighbors were up to. The intimate party was planned for Saturday night, and if I was lucky, it would be at the Goods' house. We'd been there often enough for BBQs and poolside gatherings that I knew the layout well enough to find a good spot to spy on the activities. Just in case, I installed a tracking program on Jenny's phone. Saturday was a long day. I spent it in the hotel room, waiting for Jenny's phone to show that she was on the move. There was no need to wait long. At 5 p.m., Jenny left the house and headed to the goods place. I drove to our neighborhood in a rental car and parked on a nearby street. The goods have a small garden tool shed in their backyard, and I was able to get inside without being seen by climbing over a six-foot fence. Over the next two hours, I used a video camera and a digital camera to document the events at the goods party. I recorded different combinations of couples, filming them having a night by the pool or in the living room behind glass patio doors. I used a digital camera with a telephoto lens to capture close-ups. The faces of the participants were clear enough that there was no doubt about their identities. The photographs were evidence of some of the most disgusting things I could imagine. The hardest part was watching and recording my wife, yes, she was the main focus and the obvious star of the show. The other women at the party may have had decent bodies, but Jenny had the best, and all the men took advantage of the situation, sometimes in different combinations. You can't understand true heartbreak until you see the woman you love, with whom you plan to have kids and grow old together, having an intimate with two guys at once. The patio doors were closed, but I could still see into the lit room where Jenny was sitting on some guy's lap. The next guy threw her on the couch and started having a night with her. After almost two hours of this, I had captured the faces of all the participants and their compromising poses. It was time to leave. Sitting in the car, trying to calm down, I felt like I wanted to cry, but I didn't. I wanted to hurt Jenny and all her lovers, but I didn't. Instead, I returned to my hotel room after stopping to buy a bottle of Jack Daniels. I sat and thought about what to do next. I didn't get drunk, I stayed up late thinking about my life and the options the lawyer had given me. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that, aside from being married to the woman I loved until tonight, my life was crap. I hated my boss and my job. I hated living in the Midwest with its cold winters. When the temperature finally rose above zero, it was still impossible to go outside due to mosquitoes carrying diseases like West Nile virus. I hated the big house that Jenny had wanted so much before we had kids, with its large lawn that required watering and fertilizing and had to be mowed twice a week. I didn't care about almost any of my neighbors, and that number had just been cut in half. It was now clear that I would leave Jenny. I've heard that some men can tolerate their wife's cheating, even those who are turned on by it. How, I don't know, but it's not for me. I tried to sleep. It was hard, but sleep finally came after I stared at the hotel room ceiling for what seemed like hours, thinking about how I screwed everything up and why things turned out the way they did. After graduating from the University of Minnesota with a double degree in German and Russian, the army offered me a job. All I had to do was sign up for the next four years. The advantage of the army over other options was that I wouldn't have to spend two or three years doing menial work, 
I would immediately start doing real translations as soon as I finished basic training. I met Jenny during my last year at the Pentagon. She was a waitress at a bar where my friends and I often hung out. I won't lie, the main attraction was her beautiful face, sweet smile, and amazing body. We dated for seven months before I proposed to her. Jenny said yes, and two months after I left the army, we got married and settled in Minneapolis. Jenny had few skills. I don't want to sound harsh, but intelligence was not one of her strong points. I couldn't imagine her going back to work in a bar. It was hard enough watching all the guys hit on her when we were dating. Although this meant less money, Jenny found a part-time job selling dresses. Money was not an issue as I was making good money, enough so that after four years, when prices had not yet fully recovered from the housing market crash, we could buy our dream home. Our main reasons for moving to Minneapolis played a cruel joke on me. Two years after the move, my dad received early retirement, and he and my mom decided to follow the example of other retirees and move to Florida, selling their home. My sister, who never liked the harsh Minnesota winters, followed them there. I don't want to make excuses for Jenny, there is no excuse for her participation in the goods parties. But I think when my mom and sister moved to Florida, it left a void in Jenny's life, an emptiness that may have contributed to her subsequent infatuation with her new neighbors, especially Doris. After Jenny and I bought our house, we gave ourselves a year to get it in order and ready for the baby. Instead, I now found myself trying to sleep in a strange bed, wondering what I'd be doing in a year instead of holding a newborn in my arms. I woke up Sunday morning relieved that I hadn't overdone it on Jack Daniels the night before and didn't have a hangover to make me feel worse. There was a diner across the street that served a decent breakfast. I reviewed the list I had made, a few things I wanted to take with me and a list of our assets, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, etc. The list of things I wanted to keep was short, most of our money had gone towards the down payment on the house. I spent several hours in the room sorting through photos and videos from the night before. It was amazing how much detail a digital camera could capture, even in low light. I highlighted the best photos and left the others for later. I didn't think they were innocent, they must have known that Jenny was there without her husband, and in my opinion, that should have made her off-limits. On Monday, I began to seriously prepare for my departure. Jenny didn't expect me back from my business trip until Friday, giving me four days to organize everything and try to do it right. I went to the first of five local car dealerships in search of my next vehicle. After finding good options at two of them, I finalized the deal with the best offer and drove off the dealer lot in a used camper van with a check for $2,000, leaving behind my one-year-old Chrysler 300. The dealer had offered me a favorable deal, but I did everything right, and now I had a vehicle for my travels. On Tuesday and Wednesday, I worked on financial matters and outfitting the van with everything necessary for a long trip. By Thursday, I was ready, a full day ahead of schedule. It was one of those days when Jenny was working at the store. When I got home, I packed all the things I wanted to take into the van. There were few items, and they didn't clutter up the space too much. I left a note on the kitchen table with two photos, one of her with Goose and Thompson, and a wedding photo of us, torn in half. I thought about keeping the engagement ring but decided I could sell it somewhere down the road. It was made of gold and must have cost at least one tank of gasoline. The note read, Jenny, I will not live with a liar and a cheater. Goodbye. My first stop would be Naples, Florida, where my parents had settled after my father retired. The van was pleasant to drive. I drove 12 hours a day, mostly on back roads, before finding a campsite to spend the night. I quickly learned that there are good campsites and bad ones and I needed to differentiate between them if I was going to be traveling for any length of time. On the third day, in the evening, I drove up to my parents' house. Mom hugged me tightly, and Dad even gave me a hearty handshake. They knew I was coming to visit but didn't know the details. It was going to be difficult, they both loved Jenny and were looking forward to becoming grandparents. What's going on, George? Why are you here? I didn't want to go into detail right away, not on the porch. When we enter the house, I said, Jenny called looking for me. Mom looked sad. Why would she look for you? Doesn't she know you're here? She's probably too embarrassed to call and talk to you. I left Jenny. I caught her cheating. Mom was shocked. 
I cannot believe it. Not Jenny. Please believe me, Mom. I don't want to show you pictures to prove it. She became involved with our neighbors. They participate in inappropriate activities. Dad finally found the words, why the devil knows. I found out about this and decided to leave. I haven't talked to Jenny and don't plan to. Are you going to get a divorce? That's the point, Dad. I went to a lawyer and found out how much I would be financially burdened if we filed for divorce. I'd be paying her support for years. It won't happen. I just left. This isn't like you, son. No, it doesn't look like it, but maybe it's time to change my habits. I graduated from college in three years, went straight into the army where I spent four years, got a job the first month, got married, and then spent five years trying to get ahead to raise children with the love of my life. So here I am, 30 years old, no kids, no wife, a four-year-old van, and about $6,000 in the bank. Great deal, right? Mom chimed in, isn't it possible to forgive Jenny and return to her, that is, if she apologizes and promises not to do it again? I felt sorry for my mother, always an optimist, always ready to forgive, always seeing the good in people. I hugged her. No, Mom, you didn't see what I saw. She's been with more than one person. You didn't hear how she pretended to miss me when she thought I was going on a business trip, only to arrange a meeting with the neighbors and their friends. Lying was almost as bad as cheating. Both destroyed my trust in her. Around 7 in the evening, my sister Gina arrived at our parents' house. It was nice to see my little sister again. Even though she was 5 years younger than me, we were pretty close until I left for college. We always found time to talk when I came home for the holidays, but after joining the army, maintaining this closeness became more difficult. I never realized how much I missed her and how much she had matured until that evening. We walked along the beach as the sun set, casting a bright red glow across the sky. Without mom and dad around, we could talk openly. Jenny called me last night, Gina said. She said you left and only left a note. Did she tell you what the note said and why you left? No, she only asked that if I heard from you, I would ask you to call her so she could explain. So tell me, big brother, what's going on? Jenny got involved with our neighbor's parties, activities she was involved in without me, of course. I was supposed to be on a business trip. I filmed her with several different people. I knew something would happen, so I stayed in a hotel nearby and observed it myself. Gina seemed taken aback by my revelation. Oh, have you hired a private detective? No, I didn't need to. I saw the message on her phone and decided to take action myself. After getting proof, I quit my job, bought a van, and left Minneapolis. Now, I'm planning to travel for a while, starting with the States and, if there's money left, maybe Europe. What about Jenny? Are you going to get a divorce? As I told mom and dad, getting a divorce would financially ruin me. I'd be paying her support for years. So, I've decided to just leave. Well, would you consider taking your little sister with you? I have a few weeks of vacation and would like to spend them on the road with you, as long as I don't bother you. Gina smiled a sly smile. Gina, this isn't about finding a replacement for Jenny. It's about getting my thoughts in order, understood? Anyway, if you're heading out west, I'd like to join you for a couple of weeks. I heard that Utah is beautiful. Agreed. We'll go in the fall when there are fewer people and it's not so hot. Now, I need you to do me a big favor. I need your computer expertise. Gina was one of those rare women who didn't let sexism hold her back from becoming an expert programmer. What do you need, big brother? I told Gina about the videos and photos from Jenny's parties and my plans for them. As I laid out my plan for revenge, Gina's smile grew wider until she began to laugh. Agreed, big brother. I can arrange this. It took several weeks to organize everything and cover our tracks so that nothing would lead back to us. Three weeks after I left Minnesota, everything was ready. I knew Gina was good with computers, but what she was able to do amazed me. First, Gina and her boyfriend Dennis found the names and personal information of all the singles and couples who attended the parties. They sent phishing emails to every participant, which, when clicked, 
downloaded a virus that gave Gina access to all the victim's contacts, including email addresses. It was a bonanza. Kyle Good, who owned a local John Deere dealership, was a prime target. Gina and Dennis hacked into the store's computer and downloaded customers' email and physical addresses. A website was created and hosted by a company in Ukraine specializing in amateur adult films. When I asked how we did all this without fear of being tracked, Gina and Dennis just laughed and explained how the hosting was paid for in Bitcoin and all routes went through so many nodes that only the CIA could trace us. I nodded as they explained, though it was still unclear, and I decided to trust their expertise. Harry Thompson was an enigma. We weren't able to hack his computer or find much personal information about him. He wasn't on social media, and the goods computer didn't have his email address, so we couldn't find out where he worked. Dennis suggested Harry was probably involved in some illegal activity, and we eventually gave up trying to find anything on him. Gina had a friend who was an expert in video editing, and he spent time creating a film from the videos and photographs. Each time a new scene appeared in the video, it was paused to superimpose close-ups of the participants' faces from photographs to identify them. The 45-minute video was uploaded to the website and was ready. This next part might anger some people and make others shake their heads in disgust. When we edited the video, I didn't include the scene where Jenny was with multiple people at once. We left one scene where Jenny was with another person, enough to show her participation but not so much as to cause her too much embarrassment. Many have asked why I didn't expose everything. I have only one answer, Jenny's parents, Robert and Linda Rawlings, are two of the kindest, sweetest people I have ever known. They accepted me into their family, treated me like a son, and if they ever saw or heard about our video, they deserved better than to see their daughter in that light, even if she didn't deserve it. It broke my heart. So, while the video clearly proved Jenny's involvement, it didn't include her most compromising moments. One sunny morning in Florida, Gina arrived at her parents' house. She sat down at the kitchen table with her usual cup of black coffee and asked, Everything is ready, elder brother. The site is launched, letters are loaded, and a couple of hundred letters to goods clients who don't have email have been sent. Are you ready to press the button? It's time to act. Yes, Gina, it's time. Let's get started. Gina took out her phone and gave the command. Dennis, send the letters. Gina looked at me. Our friend is flying to Vegas today. He'll send the letters when he lands so they can't be traced back to us. I think we covered our tracks as best we could. Thank you, Gina. Thanks for everything. I'm leaving tomorrow to start my travels. Gina handed me a credit card. Dennis suggested one more thing. It was his idea to get a credit card in your name for cases when you need to pay for something and cannot use cash. Any state and national campgrounds require reservations, and you'll need a credit card for that. The card is in my name, but it won't matter if you make reservations under my name. I won't complain to the bank about fraud. This way, no one can track you through the card. The limit is $5,000. You can return it to me when it's convenient. I hugged Gina. It was almost too much to expect. Thank you. Thank Dennis too. Well, don't forget that you promised we'd go together later. Like I said, it's too hot and crowded in Utah's national parks right now. Let's plan to meet at the end of September and visit some of these parks. Agreed. We'll go in the fall when there are fewer people and it's not so hot. Gina headed to work, and I went to get the van ready for the trip. The next morning, I kissed my mom goodbye and gave my dad a manly hug. I thanked them for letting me stay for a while, promised to be careful, and keep in touch. Then my father surprised me by leaning toward the open passenger door window of the van. I love you, son. I always knew he loved me, he showed it a thousand times when I was growing up, but he had never said it. My eyes watered as I pulled out of the driveway. I took the back roads north through Virginia to the Blue Ridge Parkway and spent a week traveling southwest to North Carolina. I went north to Nashville, where I spent two days on Broadway listening to great music and visited Shiloh National Monument, something I had wanted to see ever since I gave a report on Western battles of the Civil War in high school. I started heading west with a plan to stop in Memphis to spend time on Beale Street and maybe visit Graceland. One night, while I was sleeping in the van parked along State Route 64, east of Boulevard, Tennessee, 
I was awakened by a knock on the door. It was a state patrol officer standing with one hand on the butt of his service pistol, the holster unfastened. Can I help you, officer? How long have you been parked here? I parked around 10 in the evening. I was too tired to drive any further and decided to get some sleep. Can I see your driver's license? I handed him my license, and he returned to his patrol car to check it. I sat in the passenger seat and waited for him to return. When he approached, I began to worry. Something in his gaze alarmed me, he still had his hand on the gun. Mr. Baker, did you know there was an arrest warrant issued for you? No, I didn't know. Does it indicate what it's for? I didn't get any details. It's a misdemeanor warrant. Is there a reason someone is looking for you in Minnesota? I gave the officer a brief version of what happened, then he added, I think some judge awarded my wife alimony and I didn't pay it. The officer smiled. Well, I have to detain you, but now I need to catch a car that just drove by at high speed. I think it's a drunk driver, and that's more important than your warrant. You can stay here and wait for me to return, or since the state line is 30 minutes away, you could head south on Route 18 and get out of my jurisdiction. Do you understand what I mean? I didn't see any speeding cars, so I figured the officer was doing me a favor. Perhaps he had his own history of heartache. I nodded. Yes, officer. You won't set me up, right? The officer responded, you can ask anyone, even my future ex-wife. I'd rather cut off my left hand than frame the person who helped me. I'd advise you to cross the border sooner rather than later. With that, he headed west and I headed south into Mississippi. Given that I had missed Beale Street, I was drawn to the sounds of New Orleans and its Bourbon Street, continuing south. Three days of drinking and listening to jazz, Zydeco, and Creole music took a toll on my wallet. I pawned my gold wedding ring, bought a tank of gas, two bottles of Dixie beer, and a large bowl of gumbo before heading west. I needed to avoid major cities and their associated expenses until my funds were replenished. I still had a few thousand dollars, but I was spending it quickly. I talked to a few other wanderers on the road and learned from them how to cut costs associated with my new lifestyle. One way was to dry camp on BLM lands, which was very affordable. One couple I met along the way suggested I visit Big Bend National Park, describing it as a paradise. With no specific destination and no one waiting for me, I decided to head to Big Bend. I found myself at the bar at the Starlight Theater Steakhouse in Trilingua, just outside the park, listening to a group of Australians at the next table bantering with each other. I must have been paying too much attention to their conversation, trying to understand their accents, when the largest of the group, a mountain of a man, six feet six inches tall and weighing at least 250 pounds, stood up and walked towards me. It's rude to eavesdrop on other people's conversations, buddy. I must have been in a cheeky mood because my reply might have earned me a punch. I wouldn't call it eavesdropping, considering I don't understand half of what you're saying with your accents. The mountain man was taken aback. Well, you're a cheeky Yankee. What makes you think it's our accent that's funny and not yours? Well, you're sitting in a Texas bar, so it's your accent that seems unusual. If we were in a bar in Brisbane, mine would be strange. Considering that you're a guest in our country, let me buy you a beer. All hostility disappeared thanks to my refusal to be intimidated and mainly due to my offer to buy him a beer. The mountain of a man extended his hand. My name is John. The beer is Foster's, and you're invited to join our table. I'm George, and I accept the invitation. I hadn't spent much time in company since my time in Florida, and even though I only understood half of what was being said if the speaker didn't bother to explain it in English, I had the best time I'd had in months. These people knew how to drink and have fun. Even the ladies drank more than I did. There were eight of them traveling together. They had spent four weeks in the U.S., starting in Dallas. Eventually, they invited me to join their camping caravan. They appeared to be in pairs, one of the couples, James and Sarah, were married, while others had casual relationships. Although I was the odd one out, I decided this was too good an opportunity to pass up and spend the next two weeks with them. After leaving Texas, our caravan traveled to Roswell, New Mexico. The Australians were eager to see where all the UFO hysteria began. It was almost a letdown, but at least we could all say we were there and cross it off our lists. 
The White Sands Monument was interesting, though the men wanted to continue west the tombstone, and the women voted against it, calling it another tourist trap. So, we headed north to Colorado instead. I stayed out of the discussion and was happy to be anywhere with this fun group. The Colorado Rockies were breathtaking, I had never seen such beauty. Growing up in the Midwest, I had only spent time east of the Rockies. The Australians and I spent the last week crossing the state before parting ways at Breckenridge. They were returning to Texas, and I was heading to Grand Junction, where Gina was supposed to meet me. We spent the last evening going from bar to bar on Main Street before I said goodbye, promising to visit Australia someday. As I walked back to my van, Mary came up to me and took my hand. Can I stay with you tonight? I was pleasantly surprised but didn't want to interfere with my new friend's dynamics. What about John? Would you mind if you stay with me? John has an eye for that American blonde with the fake breasts, and by all accounts, he will spend the night with her. John and I travel well together and have a lot of fun, but we're not what you'd call exclusive. Mary's offer was tempting. I had never had a one-night stand and preferred being in a relationship when I slept with someone. Does this mean you won't sleep with me? I looked at Mary, contemplating ending my long abstinence. Hell no, come with me. I put my arm around Mary's waist and led her to the van. We drove back to the campsite, where Mary flattered me by telling me she had been hoping for this opportunity ever since we met and that other girls would be envious. We quickly became intimate, and it had been months since I had been with Jenny. I decided to take my time to reacquaint myself with the female body, and Mary seemed to appreciate my efforts. When I woke up the next morning, Mary was already dressed, sitting on the bed and holding my hand. Seeing that I opened my eyes, she leaned over and kissed me goodbye. George, don't let what that woman did to you affect your relationships with others. There are many good, faithful women in the world. You are a wonderful man, and you will find one of them. I couldn't resist. Is there any chance that this woman will be you? No, I'm afraid we won't succeed either. I will be too far from my family, or you will be too far from yours. I've been listening to you for the last two weeks. You're close to your sister and parents, and I couldn't take you away from them. No grandmother wants to be half a world away from her grandchildren. Mary was right, of course. Thank God the first woman I had been with, Jenny, was smarter and more practical than me. Well, I had to ask. Thanks for last night. You'll never know how much it meant to me. I think I know. It meant a lot to me too. Take care, George. Enjoy your hikes with your sister. Mary kissed me on the lips and left the van. All the other Australians came to see me at the station before leaving that morning. I was especially pleased to receive a firm handshake and hug from John, his smile wide as he reminded me of my promise to come to Australia someday. Driving towards Grand Junction, I felt good. Hanging from the rearview mirror was the necklace Mary had left that morning. There was a note in the ashtray. This is for Gina. Tell your sister that I'm sorry we didn't meet and that her brother is a gentleman and a great guy. With love, Mary. It was an inexpensive shell necklace that Mary always wore, and the note meant the world to me. Gina and I were walking through Arches National Park, heading toward Delicate Arch, when we crossed paths with another hiker, Abby Ross. She was walking alone, approximately 5 feet 7 inches tall and built like an athlete. Her long black hair and dark skin complemented her striking features. She passed Gina and me on the trail, and after she passed, Gina caught me staring. What's up, George? Gina simply smiled at my attempt to play innocent. All of you men are the same. Just because a woman has a great figure, you can't help but notice. Oh, and you say that women are different. I saw you practically drooling over that tall guy at the airport carousel while waiting for your luggage. I almost took a photo of you to send to Dennis, let him see how you act when he's not around. God, don't you dare. I admit I looked, but I would never act on it. I've been completely faithful to Dennis since we've been together. So, you're serious with him? Like a heart attack. I think he's going to propose when I get back to Florida. You wanted to join us on this journey but couldn't get out. I'm happy for my sister. She deserves a good guy like Dennis. 
When we reached the top, I was pleased to find a female tourist taking pictures of the arch Gina did me a favor by approaching her and introducing herself while I stayed a bit away, preparing lunch. The exchange between the two women was friendly. By the time I had everything ready, Gina came up to me with Abby and introduced us. Abby, this is my brother George. George, this is Abby Ross. I invited her to join us for lunch and finally convinced her. We ate, told stories, and when it was time to head back down, we went together. When Gina learned that Abby had not found a place to stay, she invited Abby to share our place in Devil's Garden. Abby protested but couldn't dissuade Gina. The three of us had dinner together and spent a lovely night under the stars around the fire. Thus began my friendship with Abby Ross from Clamel Falls, Oregon. Abby went hiking with us in Arches and Canyonlands and agreed to join us when we went to Goblin Valley State Park. Abby was a waitress in Clamel Falls and had recently graduated from the local community college. We eventually found out that she was traveling and camping alone because her long-term boyfriend had left her for another girl three weeks before their planned trip. Abby decided to go alone but was happy to join Gina and me. I didn't expect how lonely it would be without him. Thank you both for letting me join. After Goblin Valley, Abby had to go home, and we promised each other to stay in touch. I had another week to spend with Gina. We said goodbye to Abby before heading to Bryce Canyon. In the van, Gina began her interrogation. So, what do you think, big brother? Nice girl, isn't she? Very nice girl, I agreed, but I didn't get any romantic vibes from her. My question is... She was still hurting from the recent breakup, but I noticed she looked at you more than just as a friend a few times. Give her time, and she might be ready for romance. Nothing more was said between us about our new friend for the next week, but when I took Gina to the airport, she started talking about it again. Call her, George. Maybe go to Clamel Falls and spend a couple of days with her without me. I bet you $100 she'll say yes if you ask. Okay, okay. Just so you stop tormenting me, I'll call. Say hi to mom and dad for me and wish Dennis well. Call me when you land. I returned to my van and took out the map. 1,000 miles if you take the scenic route. Most of it is on US 50 through Nevada, the loneliest road in America, how symbolic. I was in no rush and didn't mind being alone, especially after two weeks with the Aussies and the next two weeks with Gina. This gave me time to think. By the time I reached Reno, I had made my decision and called Abby. She sounded pleased to hear from me and agreed without hesitation when I asked if she wanted company. Abby had to work for the next two days, but then she had three days off. I took my time and arrived on the morning of her first day off. Abby and I spent the three days hiking and exploring the southwest corner of Oregon, from Crater Lake to Ashland, where we saw Shakespeare's As You Like It at a replica Globe Theater. It was a wonderful three days and although the van was cramped, nothing more intimate happened between us other than holding hands. I wished I could have done more, but it was clear that Abby wasn't ready for that kind of relationship. Still, it was fun, and when I dropped her off on Thursday, I vowed to head back through Clamel Falls when I returned from my next stop, Glacier National Park. I needed to get up there as quickly as possible. It was already the end of October, and winter was soon to come, especially at high altitudes. During my stay in Glacier, I received an offer for future employment from one of my former commanders. She offered me a position providing translation services as a contractor at the Paris Embassy. I had three weeks to catch a plane to Paris, so I left Glacier that same day. I spent two days with Abby, who was able to swap shifts with two other servers, and we spent the time getting to know each other better. We ended up kissing and hugging, but nothing more. Comparing one woman to another is always dangerous. Jenny, my first partner, liked to relax and read magazines slowly on weekends, while Abby was always eager to start the day early and tackle tasks with enthusiasm. Abby also had a passion for literature, having read the brothers Karamazov, Anna Karenina, and War and Peace. The more I spent time with Abby, the more I realized that we shared similar views on many important matters. I was captivated by Abby and hoped that her ex-boyfriend wouldn't try to rekindle their romance while I was abroad. I fell in love with Abby and told her so, but I had to leave the following year, and I struggled to explain the nature of our relationship fully. We planned to invite her to visit me in Paris. 
I drove straight to Naples, stopping along the way for my usual six hours of sleep. Following the highway allowed me to arrive at my parents' driveway within four days. I obtained the necessary documents and visas without issues, meaning the charges against me in Minnesota had been dropped, and I was no longer a fugitive. Ten days after arriving in Florida, I kissed my parents and sister goodbye and boarded a plane to Paris. In Paris, I met Simone Pirate, a 25-year-old who was different from anyone I had known before. My parents would call her type bohemian. When we first spent the night together, I felt unsure due to her petite frame, but any doubts vanished quickly as we spent time together. Simone and I had a vibrant relationship, we enjoyed hanging out in cafes with her bohemian friends, smoking, drinking absinthe, and discussing literature. Our debates, especially about Sartre and Camus, were intense but stimulating, and our disagreements often led to passionate reconciliations. After four months together, Simone left Paris with another couple from Mediterranean town, and I missed her but not the debates. It was probably time for us to part ways. I had been putting off visiting Abby for a month. Since I was doing well financially, I sent Abby plane tickets, knowing she wouldn't have been able to afford them on a waitress's salary. She would be visiting for two weeks in May, which, contrary to the song, is much nicer than April. I have to say, I wasn't prepared for my reaction when I picked up Abby at the airport. I watched her walk toward me, and all my loving feelings for her overflowed inside me. When she put down her travel bag to hug and kiss me, she held my head in her hands, not letting the kiss end until she realized we were in a public place. It was a very French moment. I took Abby to my house and suggested she take a nap. She was in touch with O'Hare as we planned to go out that evening to celebrate her arrival. I went to work for a few hours, and when I returned to the apartment, I was pleasantly surprised. Abby had clearly spent some time finding city clothes. I had only seen her in casual attire before, but now she was dressed in a stylish skirt and sweater, a matching leather jacket, and high heels. Seeing my reaction, she asked, Do you like it? It's fantastic, I replied. Let me clean up and change into something suitable to accompany such a beautiful woman. That night was wonderful. Paris seemed to embrace Abby warmly. The best part was that Abby and I shared a close moment for the first time that evening. Over the next five days, I showed Abby all the typical Paris sites, the Louvre, Notre Dame, Shakespeare and Company bookstore, and the top of the Eiffel Tower. On the sixth day, we took the high-speed train for a three-and-a-half-hour journey to Goblin State Park. When I mentioned my plans, Abby was concerned because she didn't have appropriate hiking gear. Despite her initial reluctance, I convinced her to get what she needed, presenting it as a late Christmas and early birthday gift. Although there was still snow on the higher ground, we enjoyed walking along the Alpine trails for three days. Returning to Paris, we continued to explore the city and check off items on Abby's list. Everything was going well until our final night when we stopped at a small cafe for a goodbye drink before heading back to my apartment. There, a group of Simone's friends, who knew about our past relationship, saw us and insisted we join them. Abby and I found ourselves drifting apart, she was conversing with two women while I was talking to men. When it was time to leave, I saw the hurt in Abby's eyes. When were you going to tell me about Simone? she asked. I explained, I didn't mean to hide it. It was a brief affair before we became intimate, and now that we're together, I promise I won't be with anyone else. Abby was not satisfied. I thought when you said you loved me, it meant something, she said through tears. I thought it was more than just words. She went into the bedroom and began packing for her flight. When she emerged later, her eyes were still red. I'll take a taxi to the airport. Let me take you, I offered. No, I need to be alone. I'm sorry this happened. I had such a good time with you, but now I feel like I'm just a temporary replacement until Simone returns to Paris. I tried to comfort her. It's not true. Let's talk when I return. I'm leaving for Moscow tomorrow for important negotiations. Communication will be limited. She kissed me goodbye and said, I love you, George Baker. I replied, I love you, Abby Ross. She left without saying another word. Over the next two weeks in Moscow, communication was limited. When I returned to Paris, my first call to Abby was tense. Before we could address our issues, 
I had to go back to Moscow because the initial agreements were falling apart. Talk about bad timing. Abby was understanding but expressed the need for us to talk soon. In July, Gina, Dennis, Mom, and Dad came to visit. One advantage of being stationed in Paris was that it was easier to convince people to come and stay. Gina brought great news. Jenny had explained that I was no longer a fugitive. She was renting out our old house, and if the buyers purchased it, it would clear the mortgage and any outstanding debts. Jenny filed for divorce citing abandonment, and we would be officially divorced by next June without any additional effort on my part. Gina brought the documents, I signed them, and we had a great time in Paris. The only exception was when Gina teased me for letting Abby go. Gina, I'm not trying to avoid it. I'll sort everything out when I get back to the States, I promise. Damn it, you're such a fool, big brother, Gina said. Do you think a woman with your looks, personality, and intelligence will miss you for long? She was right, but for the next few months, all I could do was Skype with Abby and write love letters. My first stop upon returning to the States was Clamel Falls. Abby not only welcomed me with open arms, but did everything she could to show that we were a couple again. However, there was one major issue. I needed a job, and the only offer I received on the West Coast was from a tech company in Los Angeles. Family was very important to Abby, and she wanted to stay close to hers, while I needed to be in a place with more opportunities related to my field. Clamel Falls did not offer those opportunities. Even though we were on the same continent, we were still 700 miles apart. For the next few months, we spent at least one weekend a month together, either in Clamel Falls or Los Angeles. In May, we took two weeks off to hike in Joshua Tree, Kings Canyon, and Death Valley. There was no doubt that we were compatible and in love, but I still struggled with the idea of marriage. This was likely due to my own insecurities and trust issues. Let's be honest, my history with women didn't inspire confidence. Jenny didn't leave me, but I wasn't good enough for her to stay faithful. Simone left me, and although we weren't suited for each other, it still stung. Abby claimed she loved me, but not enough to leave her family and move to California. We continued to date whenever possible, and I was completely faithful, with no doubts that she was too. I didn't give up and kept searching for a way for us to be together. Sometimes life offers unexpected gifts, sometimes it delivers a gut punch, and sometimes, as if by chance, you come across a perfect moment that can't be missed. In July, I received two such gifts. First, a New York publishing house offered me my dream job, translating Joseph Stalin's personal papers and letters from Russian to English for an upcoming book. The documents had already been translated by a Russian translator, but the publisher realized much had been omitted. I was to provide an unbiased second translation. This work would take some time, but the best part was that I could do it from anywhere, even Clamel Falls. Then, less than a week after signing the contract, something incredible happened. Two years and two months after leaving my home in Minnesota, I woke up to a knock on the door. I put on my sweatpants and went to answer it, wondering who could be so early. To my surprise, Jenny was standing there. Hi, George, she said, not the greeting I expected after such a long time. I looked down at her hands, half expecting her to be holding a weapon, but she was just holding a manila envelope. Can I come in? She asked. I stepped aside to let Jenny in. Should I make some coffee? It would be nice, she replied. I left the hotel this morning before breakfast. I decided to be polite, hoping time would soften old wounds. I'll make scrambled eggs. I didn't come for breakfast, George. I came to give you this. Jenny held out the envelope. Our divorce was finalized two months ago. I thought you should know. I glanced through the documents. You could have mailed it. There's nothing here I need to sign. Jenny's composure began to falter, and her voice grew emotional. I wanted to give this to you personally. I didn't want to be a coward like you. I wanted to look you in the eye and let you know how much I hated you for leaving without a word, just a note. Jenny collapsed onto the sofa, sobbing. You have no idea how much my heart broke when I saw you with those people. I'm sorry, I said. I thought we were in love and ready to start a family. I was ready to have our children. But then Doris started coming around, filling my head with nonsense. 
She said that once you realized what you were missing, you'd come back. I truly believed our vows meant something. Jenny lowered her head, staring at the floor. My curiosity got the better of me. So what happened after I left? Did you stay with the group? No, I never did, she said. I probably only spoke to Doris a couple of times after I came home and found your note. Plus, your little bomb disrupted everything. I raised an eyebrow. My little bombshell? Oh, don't pretend you didn't post the videos and photos or send anonymous emails to half of Minneapolis. Everyone suspected it was you, but no one had proof, Jenny said. I didn't think about it at the time, but later I realized that I had left a photo of you, Kyle, and Harry on the dining room table. If anyone had seen it, they would have had proof that I was behind the website. I burned the photo ten minutes after I saw it. I felt bad knowing there was evidence of my behavior in her home, and even if I hadn't destroyed it, I would never have shared it with others. I couldn't betray you a second time. First, Kyle lost his John Deere dealership. His contract with Deere included a community standards clause. Who would have thought progressives in Minnesota would be so outraged? When people stopped buying from the store, Deere left, leaving Kyle to sell cheap Chinese tractors and junk. The store went bankrupt, and Kyle was deeply in debt. Doris then left him for Harry. I was somewhat pleased with this turn of events, but Jenny wasn't finished. Kyle ended up taking his own life. Doris was unable to find happiness with Kyle's best friend, Harry, who had anger issues. After sending Doris to the hospital, Harry ended up in prison, where he would stay for at least eight years. He received a year for the assault and ten years for distributing oxycodone. It just kept getting worse, and I couldn't help but laugh. Jenny continued, two other couples moved out as well. It seems the school authorities didn't take kindly to primary school teachers being involved in a scandal. And you? I asked. Other than completely ruining my personal life by driving away the man I loved, my professional life has been fairly stable, Jenny said. No one was particularly interested in the personal life of a clothing saleswoman. I cut and dyed my hair, and most people didn't recognize me from those videos. Some did, and sometimes I had to face the consequences. I switched to a full-time job and took night classes at community college. I got my associate's degree and now manage a Banana Republic store in St. Louis Park. Well done, I said, meaning it. As I said, time had softened me. Jenny began to cry. Do you see any chance for us to get back together, George? I may have mellowed, but my mind is still clear. No, sorry, Jenny, I replied. That won't happen. All trust is gone. Seeing you with others destroyed it, and you know as well as I do that a marriage without trust won't be happy. I knew you would say that, George, but I needed to ask, Jenny said. As soon as I saw your face and heard your voice, I remembered what I had lost, so I had to try again. I'm sorry too, I said. Jenny began to sob again. I once loved this woman with all my heart. In the evening, Jenny and I had dinner. I just had to ask, Jenny, why? I thought we had a good marriage. Why did you let Doris influence you? George, I've always been such a good girl. I'd never done anything wild. You were the second man in my life. Doris played on my naivety. She convinced me that sooner or later you would join in. She said no normal man could resist the opportunity to be with multiple women. She made me think there was something wrong with your libido if you resisted, that you were the problem, not us. This would never happen, I said. The vow to reject all others meant everything to me. Jenny nodded, as if agreeing. Doris gave me a book called Watching My Kristen Mom. It was about a married couple where the husband gets turned on by watching his wife with other men. She also showed me how to find such sites online. The more time I spent reading and watching, the easier it was for Doris and Kyle to convince me to attend that first party. I was the center of attention, and it fed my ego. I drove Jenny back to her hotel. I saw that she was waiting for me to ask if I could spend the night, but I stayed strong. I could have taken her to Los Angeles for her flight, but that would have been wrong for many reasons, not the least of which was my commitment to Abby. I woke up the next morning and looked at the clock. It was only 7, and Jenny's plane didn't leave until 11. 
there was enough time to pick her up and take her to Los Angeles for her flight, giving me another chance to spend a few hours with the woman I once wanted to spend my life with. But I sat down and drank a cup of coffee instead. There was something on my mind that had woken me up at 3 a.m. and kept me awake for two hours. Now everything was clear. My last night with Jenny felt like a cleansing of all the bile that had accumulated in my heart and mind. My soul felt renewed. I didn't realize until that night how important it was to close this chapter of my life with Jenny to start a new one with Abby. I showered, packed the car, and locked the apartment. With any luck, I would drive 700 miles and be in Clamel Falls before Abby finished her shift that night. I called, hoping it wasn't too early to reach someone who worked the late shift. She must have seen my name on the screen, as her voice sounded sleepy. Hi, George. Good morning. Sorry to wake you, Abby, but I wanted to ask if I could pick you up from work tonight. Why? Where are you? I'm just leaving Thousand Oaks. I need to be there by 11. Something happen? No, I just want to spend a couple of days with you. If you can take some time, maybe we can walk and talk a little. Certainly. I'll switch shifts with Janet tomorrow. Are you sure you can drive all the way? Everything will be fine. I'll see you at 11. I realized I was going to propose empty-handed, so I stopped at the Ben Bridge store in Sacramento. I was looking at wedding rings when my eyes fell on a display of sapphires next to diamonds. One ring caught my attention. I approached the counter and told the saleswoman, yes, this is it. An unconventional ring for an unconventional lady. It's perfect. Put it in a box, I said. The saleswoman smiled. She'll love it. What about the size? I hope she says yes. Then we'll worry about the size. She placed the ring in a nice blue box and swiped my credit card. Thank you. Good luck, she said. But I can tell she would be foolish to say no. Back on I-5 heading north, I called Gina while I was driving, putting the phone on speaker so I wouldn't get a ticket. Sis, today's the day. I'm coming to see Abby with a ring in my pocket and hope in my heart. Gina practically screamed over the phone. Well done, George. Do you think she'll say yes? Gina laughed. Ask her nicely, and she will be your bride by the time you say I do. I wish I had your confidence. Wish me luck, sis. Gina was almost right. I pulled up to the front door of the pub at 11.05, and Abby walked out to the car. I opened the door, got down on one knee with the box in my hand, but before I could ask her, she was already in my arms, saying yes, and kissing me on the lips, cheeks, nose, and forehead. Looks like I'm getting married again. We spent the next two days visiting her family, walking in the mountains, and enjoying each other's company. Abby was especially pleased to hear about my new contract. Seriously, George, will I marry you and live here? Then I realized Abby had agreed to my proposal without asking about our housing plans. With my new contract, it didn't matter. We could live and raise our children where she could count on the support of her mother and father. It seemed like the best of both worlds. Two days later, I was back on the road, returning to Los Angeles to tell my boss the bad news. When I arrived home, there was a note on the door. George, I had some time this morning before my flight. I thought I'd stop by and tell you again how sorry I am for betraying your trust. I don't know if we'll ever see each other or talk again, but please understand that I know it was my immature and selfish behavior, listening to bad advice from Kyle and Doris, that is the only reason we are not husband and wife today and why I will never have the children we planned for and fought for. I will always love and miss you. By the way, I understand that you spared me from the video. I know you must have filmed me in situations I will forever be ashamed of. I think you did it to spare my parents and possibly me. Whatever your reasons, I will always be grateful to you for that grace. You are a good person, Jenny. That was the last I heard from Jenny. It was October, a wonderful time in the Northwest. Abby and I had a small wedding in Clamel Falls. Mom, Dad, Gina, and Dennis came to the wedding. Two of my friends from the Army also came, and it was a small gathering from the Baker contingent. Abby's side was filled with friends from school, college, family, and co-workers. We had an open bar, snacks, live music, and a dance floor. 
It was a lively celebration, and Abby and I stayed until the last guest left. Our honeymoon was quite different from what we had imagined. Instead of camping in the woods or desert, we booked a week on the beach in the Virgin Islands. Abby got up every morning to run a few miles on the beach and then swim in the ocean. But every morning, after returning to our cabin and showering, she would pull me back to bed. Translating Stalin's documents earned me a reputation as a master of English translation of Russian literature, allowing me to support a growing family and work from home. I had to travel occasionally for meetings with authors or publishers, but it was no more than three or four weeks a year. Abby's mother passed away from cancer a year after the birth of our first son, George Adam, or G.A. Her passing came too quickly for Abby, but at least she managed to see her grandson and didn't suffer for long. It seemed that her mother had been the glue that kept the family together. Over the next year, Abby's brother and sister-in-law moved to Tucson to be closer to her family, and her father, tired of the cold, moved to Baja, Mexico, near Ensenada. Suddenly, our family had no reason to stay in Oregon. Abby brought this up herself. She thought it would be nice to live closer to my parents and Gina so they could spend more time with G.A. We sold our house in Clamel Falls and moved to Naples. Nine months later, Gina gave birth. Mom and Dad couldn't be happier, and neither could I. What do you think of our story today? I think this story was vulnerable for the husband because one day he secretly found out that his wife had been invited to a party where partners are exchanged. What would be your impression if this happened to you? Write your opinion in the comments. Until new videos.